So we talked a little bit about the arm uh, gestures, sorry, not the arm, uh, last week. And I kind of mentioned that the biggest principal difference between uh, the arm and the leg is really kind of understanding the bones, okay? And we get into this really, really deep in the spring when I teach more of the 86 class. But the biggest difference is the actual placement and direction of the bones. The femur connects right here into the great trochanter. The humerus connects actually into your shoulder blade. There is no such thing as a shoulder blade. It connects into your scapula, really, uh, and into your clavicle. Uh, and the arm, right, always moves downward towards the elbow, right? And then it comes back up towards the arm, okay? Whereas the leg, what does the leg wanna do? It wants to go in the opposite direction, right? It wants to move down towards the patella, and then it wants to move backward towards the calf. So the gestures are moving in opposite directions, right? They're opposing forces. I like to say that the gesture of the leg is a push. And what do you think the gesture of the arm is? Pull, right? Literally. They're in two different directions. One is literally propelling you to walk, right? It's pushing off. The other one is like helping you to move up and form in space. So anytime I think of like the gesture of the arms in really, really simple form, I'm always thinking about the arcs of the arms. And you're gonna notice like almost all these gestures are exactly the same. The difference is that the hand positions are shifting and those are making the shifting positions of the arms relative to those uh, hand positions. So it's kind of odd to think that, oh, L, 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 but all the arms are actually doing completely different things. But the L, the C curve that tends to want to move in this direction is a constant when you're thinking about the arm, okay? Does everyone kind of see that? The only thing that's gonna change is like the arc of the arm. If the arm is like wide, it's gonna get a little wider. If it's tapered, it's gonna get a little tapered, a little bit more tapered. And if it's foreshortened, right, the arc of that gesture is just gonna get literally shorter, okay? Because the gesture is moving away or towards you. Make sense so far? Okay. I don't know what's going on with you guys. You guys are always quiet, so I have no idea. So I'm just asking because I love you and I want to make sure you're all healthy human beings. <laughs> you're pondering? That's good. The quiet ponder. <laughs> um, the most complex bone as an artist is the scapula. Anyone know why it's complicated? The scapula is a floating bone. It doesn't actually stick to anything. So like if I move my arm around, it actually floats on top of my whole rib cage, okay? And if I move my arms back, what happens to my scapula? Anybody know? You ever see wings on a bird? Right, the wings go back, right? And they pinch, your scapula is gonna pinch. And if I move my arms forward, what's gonna happen to my scapula? Right, they're actually gonna rotate around the rib cage and they're gonna separate a little bit and they're gonna go around your form. So I kinda, we really talked about the scapula in detail in 86, but I want you to understand this because what it means is that your arm has the ability to do what? Yeah, full range of motion, right? Can go all the way back, all the way out, all the way to the front, whereas your leg, pelvis doesn't move. So the pelvis is locked in, yes, Keja. Oh, 100%. <laughs> because you have that flexibility, right? It means that you can also pull it a little bit too hard, too quick, and it will pop, right? Uh, I have this slide in the other class that I show where uh, you can see that the scapula just kind of sits back here, right? Your clavicle sits right here. There's nothing in the middle except this little ball that your femur kind of like connects to, right? Right in between both bones. Everything that's holding your shoulder in place is all muscle, right? Your deltoid connects into your, uh, your uh, humerus and it pulls itself into the scapula, into the clavicle. So if I pull my arm hard enough, right? And if my deltoid is weak, Right? You can literally extend it like a rubber band, right? It will come out and it will just like slide out of the socket. So you can always pop it back in, but it's not very pleasant, right? But it doesn't, it's not, I mean, if you do it enough, it will injure the muscle, but it won't like permanently damage it, okay? So range of motion also means you can get hurt, right? Uh, that's why it's really hard. You will never, I mean, rarely, I've never heard of anybody popping their femur out of their pelvis, right? It doesn't happen. You can break the femur, right, because the impact, but the actual big knob of the femur will always stay in that socket for the most part unless you have a really, you know, like a bad car accident or something like that. It'd have to be a really severe impact. But let's not talk about the negative. Let's talk about shapes. Uh, so what we want to think about when we think about the arm are a series of shapes, right? And the arm shapes are similar to leg shapes, but we're also talking about them in relationship to the outside of the arm and the interior of the arm, right? 
When I look at the outside of the arm, I'm thinking about the types of curves I see. The uh, tricep is the most dominant curve on the upper part of the arm, right? Kind of moving away from the deltoid, not really talking about the deltoid. And the uh, forearm tends to have this really, really dominant curve towards the bottom of the forearm. So if I just hold my forearm out, right, you're going to see that the bottom curve is a lot more dominant than the front. But all I have to do is this, whoop, and everything changes. So the wrist is kind of like, the wrist in your hand is kind of this continuing shifting form, and it kind of confuses the arm relationships a little bit. Uh, when we get into the anatomy of that, if you do take 86 in spring, we're going to talk about that twisting motion. But does anyone know what it's called when my arm is facing up? Anybody? Yeah, supinated, right? I'm holding a bowl of soup, so you want to think about supinated position. And when I just drop my arm, right, and relax it, it's called pronated position. So we're going to be talking about supinated or pronated position. But the one thing that you want to think about is when I rotate my hands up, right, all of a sudden all these muscles will start from here and they will twist around and they will actually change the shape of my arm, right? My arm will get a lot more volumetric. But if I hold my arm like this, right, my arm gets really, really linear, right? And if I flatten my arm out, all of a sudden that line flattens out on top and the bulbous section, right, of your muscles always sits closest to your triceps. So we're always thinking about those shapes in relationship to each other because they change a lot. Uh, when I think about the arm, <sighs> I think about two muscles first, in my head, at least. Uh, the first one is the deltoid, right? And the second one is the bicep. I think for me, the bicep is easier for students to recognize than the tricep. So it's something that I like to kind of think about and build on as we're building the arm. The relationship of uh, deltoid to tricep to bicep to what's called the brachioradialis to the forearm is a relationship of chain links, right? Why do I say that? Anyone know? Chain. Yeah, a chain is offset and it sh shifts in direction. So my deltoid sits on top, right? Right here. This is the peak of it. Where's my bicep? If I just have my arm down, your bicep actually shifts to the front and your tricep shifts to the back, right? If I look at my forearm, all of a sudden the most important muscles are on the front again, just like my deltoid, right? And then it shifts to the top and to the back. Why do you think your body is built like this? It distributes the weight. 100%, right? It distributes the weight when it's actually in function. If all the muscles were lined up, then all of a sudden I want to turn my hand and it's not going to have as much strength in one direction versus the other. So it's the great like genius behind the building product of the human body, right? It's actually built to be symbiotic, right? It kind of distributes weight uh, across its form really, really beautifully. So we want to think about this when we're actually drawing too. Uh, one of the things that we described when we were drawing the leg was the hierarchy of curves, right? That a curve can come up, right? And then the bicep is going to shift in the opposite direction, but they're never going to do what? They're never going to line up because parallel lines never happen in the human body, right? So I never see this like what I call the Pillsbury Dough effect. Have you ever seen the Pillsbury Doughboy, right, from the Ghostbusters? He looks like this very chat, fat, chubby thing that's like really pudgy but he doesn't have any form to him. All of a sudden, if I start shifting my line work around and designing my line work so it's linking, right, it's gonna create that chain link effects. It's actually gonna emulate how a human body actually functions and how those connections actually form, okay? The forearm is probably the most complex piece, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, when I think about steps, I think about the arm in terms of first, tapering lines, right? Why do I start with tapering lines? Same thing about the leg, right? The deltoid is the largest muscle on my arm. So it's going to be the largest, widest starting point. And if I can taper my lines, I'm giving myself a really simple point of construction that is 2D before I build to my 3D shapes. Why do I want to start in 2D? It's easier, right? If my brain can identify a simple shape that I can cut out as a silhouette, I can really quickly desi design two things. I can focus on proportions. And what is the other thing that I can focus on? Placement, right? Or perspective, whatever you want to call it. But we can focus on how long a figure should be and how wide that object on the figure should be. And I can also figure out whether or not it relates to what I am seeing. So this arm is just a simple arm that is moving 
in a downward direction, I can measure my shapes in relationship to their width and to their length. And if it makes sense, then I'm on the right track to go to the next step. The next step is to think about volume. And that means that I take my 2D and I begin to think about it in forms of 3D. You guys are doing that block figure drawing for those uh, homework assignments, right? That's exactly what we're doing when we're thinking about volume. We're actually building perspective into a simple shape. Then I'm gonna take that shape and I'm gonna design anatomically where the lines are. And I wanna pay attention to the rhythm. We're gonna talk about this rhythm a little bit, but the rhythm is the same thing that we discussed in the leg. It goes big, right? Medium, small, big, medium, small. And it does it across the plane of almost all anatomy, right? This rhythm is kind of like music. If it's played right, when I'm drawing my form, it will look accurate. If it's played wrong, when I'm drawing my form, it's going to look flat. I'm going to have a curve that kind of mimics the curve on the other side, and this will make my anatomy look flat, okay? So what I want to pay attention to is the fact that the curves aren't the same. They are always different. They kind of shift back and forth. Slideshow, okay? So even when I'm looking at my tricep to my deltoid, right? My deltoid has this really, really long curve. My tricep, short, straight. My bicep, long curve, right? We're gonna get into this anatomical landmark called the brachioradialis. Long, straight, right? And these lines will actually offset as they mark up to one another. And then it's gonna go straight to the ribs, uh, not to the ribs, to the wrist. Okay. Does everyone understand this notion of a pattern? Okay. Or rhythm? So once again, just another uh, slide to show you this chain link effect. If I think about the deltoid, right, the deltoid's facing out, biceps going this way, triceps going this way, all of a sudden the forearm kind of does the same thing and then the uh, wrist does that. So it kind of like begins to shift, sorry, this is a bad arrow right here, shift this mimic of these forms. Uh, shifts, it shifts this relationship of these uh, forms as they link together is what I meant to say, okay? Um, there are two main landmarks that I want you to understand in terms of the deltoid and in the bra brachioradialis. The deltoid is always going to show like an insertion right through here and right through here. The deltoid starts at your clavicle, right? If I'm looking at it, it wraps around the front of your arm and it's connecting right into the center of the humerus. So the deltoid wants to come and connect into the center of the arm right through here. Because it's connecting to the center of the arm and it's helping lift everything off of my shoulder line, it is sitting above everything. So it's never gonna be in line with the rest of the anatomy. Because of that, I'm always seeing insertion points. So it's gonna insert here and it's gonna insert here. What does an insertion mean to me as an artist? What does it make my line do? overlaps, right? So I want that line to come in and go and intersect into the form because it's showing me that the deltoid is connecting into the humerus. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. The bicep is hidden. It is your armpit muscle. If I scroll over, you can actually see how it goes into the arm and will go into the pectoralis major, right? It's actually part of the humerus, but it looks like it's going into the pectoralis major. So the deltoid will wrap around, but the bicep wants to come in and you're gonna see that intersection point. The bicep is gonna go big curve, right? And I simplified it here. The deltoid, uh, the tricep is gonna be a small curve and a flat, okay? Next down the line, we have this big orange thing. Big orange thing is called the brachioradialis. If you give me a thumbs up, right? Everyone wanna do this? This muscle right here, boop, boop, boop. So break your radialis. If you make a fist and you just move it back and forth, back and forth, you will actually see your break your radialis start to move. And if you hold your arm out, you're gonna see there's a little bit of a landmark right there, right underneath your uh, elbow, right above your elbow. That is a landmark that you should always draw. Why? Because the landmark, it is marking land, right? It's marking the anatomical landmark of your form. My brachioradialis wants to intersect into the center of my muscles, right? That brachioradialis is gonna come out and it's gonna leave a really big indentation right here and it's gonna always line up with this hard edge. What is this hard edge? I'll give you a hint. Anytime I see a straight line, what am I drawing? Bone, what is that hard edge? Which bone? Your elbow. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, what is the other bone that kind of marks down the arm? Your wrist bone, right? Those are the two bones that I'm trying to connect. I'm trying to connect your, L, your elbow and your wrist together by straight lines. So is there going to be a difference between a curve and a straight line when I'm drawing anatomy of the form? Yes. Curve means muscle. Straights mean what? Bones. So I want to pay attention to those differences in relationship. Okay. The brachioradialis is an interior landmark on the outside. We're just going to say forearm for the sake of keeping it easier for you guys. You're going to have the really big arc of the forearm muscle. This is a short. This is a long one. And then it's going to come down to the elbow, uh, not to the elbow, to the wrist. The wrist, there's my landmark of the brachioradialis. The wrist, I like to draw like a two by four piece of wood. Find at Home Depot, right? Why do I want to draw it like a two by four? Number one, if you hold on to your wrists, right? Doesn't matter if you're a big buff dude or a really uh, thin and scrawny dude, doesn't really matter, make a difference. You're always gonna feel your bones really shallow because your muscles become really, really thin and they run along the axis of your forearm, uh, your wrist. We talked about this a little bit. Anyone remember what kind of muscles those are? Fast twitch muscles, remember? Uh, the slower muscles are the bigger, bulkier ones. They're the ones that are weight-bearing. These fast-twitch muscles run really, really close to your bones. So if I want to see bone, that means I want to see structure. Another word for structure is perspective, right? I want to see the perspective in those muscles in, in that form, and it, it will also help me to connect to my wrist. So if I am drawing it as a simple square, I will then be able to identify how my wrist begins to shift in perspective in relationship to it, okay? The wrist is basically a polygon. Really quick proportions, right? My fingers, does anyone know this? Are the exact same length as my, my palm, right? So if I'm ever drawing, if I take my fingers and fold them in half, right, they're gonna come to the base of my palm. My palm should be about half the width of my hand and my fingers are gonna be about the other half of the width. So I will always ask you guys to start doing this. Draw your palms out, right? Understand how to place those shapes in perspective with your forms. So do this on your homework as well, okay? So big landmarks again. First one is the deltoid. Second one is the tricep, right? This third one is the bicep. Everyone should know these simple muscles. You guys are all around, have been alive long enough. This one is called the brachioradialis. I'm just gonna call it brachio right now. And then you have forearm, forearm, right? You have the long one and the short one. And then we have bone at the very end. So those are the things that we are looking for when we are drawing, okay? The brachioradialis needs to be indicated. Why? I mentioned it before. It is a landmark. Okay. Last but not least, don't forget your bones, the elbow, <laughs> and then your wrists, right? Those are kind of be the things that plant your form in perspective. Okay. Come on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these muscles because that's for another class. But what I will say is, look at the brachioradialis. So your brachioradialis stems from right beneath your elbow. It wraps around and it curves into your thumb. And it creates this big, bulky, like, step right here. And you can see how all the bulk right here is built in the beginning of your forearm, right? And it tapers into the lower end of your forearm and creates these really, really hard straights. Okay. Can anyone tell me by looking at this image, what controls your fingers? All right. Do you have separate muscles in your fingers? No. Your finger muscles actually start in your forearms. Okay. And I know I didn't talk about this with your feet too, but your calves actually control your toes. Right. The muscles actually start in your upper leg and go all the way around and wrap into. Uh, your calves and here they're going to go all the way around and they're actually going to split up and they're going to taper into each individual finger, right? These come into your thumb, these go into the bottom of your pinky, right? And if I flip it over, you can see how all these will kind of stem in. They're cutting it out, but they do this, right? This, there's one that comes out here and then there's all these that move your thumb, okay? So if you ever decide to become an, an uh, orthopedic surgeon, you're gonna have to know all these muscles for the sake of our class. We don't, thank God, because they're very complicated, okay? The other thing I want to point out is the angle of axis, and this is really important. 
you have this arc that runs down your arm that wants to go towards the elbow and come down towards the forearm, right? Wants to go back like this and comes down towards the forearm. But when I draw the individual anatomy, you're gonna see it kind of does this thing where it twists, right? It kind of wants to taper and create like an offset hierarchy even as it's kind of enveloping itself. So it's this chain link effect, but it happens internally as well. So I have two different gestures that I'm thinking about. One gesture is the gesture of the overall arm. And then the other gesture is every individual anatomical landmark as it begins to intersect within the form. So there's two different relationships that I wanna think about. I always wanna start with the easy one, right? If we go back to that illustration, if I start with shape first, right? I'm just focusing on proportions and perspective. I want to build anatomy only when I've designed my silhouettes and only when I begin thinking about these overlaps, right? The overlaps are what are creating that relationship of the changing dynamics of those uh, muscles. So we really need to have those overlapping lines. They are crucial, okay? They're the things that are gonna help me establish an understanding of how those forms begin to act, right? All right. I have a whole bunch of drawings here, but I think the easiest way to kind of go about this is to demo. This is funny. <laughs> You're so cute. Um, the one thing that I want to point out is that the hardest thing about the anatomy of the muscles in the arms and the legs is that they change. Okay, what do I mean by they change? Shapes change all the time, right? They flex and they contract. And they do this based on what their actions are. So the curves that we're identifying shift. This is why I don't like to talk about curves too much when I'm talking about the arms, but it's also important to know. So if my arm is facing up and holding something up, it could be really, really simple in terms of like how I see the relationship of the curves. But if my arm begins pushing against something, all of a sudden the curves that I used to see will begin to pull and extend into a place where they're actually pushing against the surface and they'll begin to shift the paradigm of those muscles. So not only do I have to memorize what all the shapes are doing, I also have to be aware of how those shapes change based on their action, okay? So something to always keep in mind. One of the things that I like to say is if bones are a point of reference for like where I'm thinking about my straights, I'm also thinking about straights in relationship to how I think about pressure, right? If my arm is pushing against a stool, all of a sudden, all those lines are gonna get straighter. If my arm is like behind a head, right, those arms, the muscles are gonna contract a lot because you're pushing those muscles against each other, but then the forearm is gonna straighten out. So I'm always thinking about how those arms, how the anatomy of the arms begins to relate to itself, okay? Oh, I don't wanna talk about deltoid. Let's do this. Uh, let's talk about these muscles individually. The deltoid starts from the clavicle. It runs right in line with the pectoralis major, comes up and around, and it goes into the humerus, right? If I lift it, it will begin to taper because the pectoralis major will kind of become more important. The deltoid will push the trapezius, and the trapezius will make like a little bump, okay? And if I extend it, you're going to notice the trapezius will drape, and the deltoid will also drape. So the curves will change based on the relationship of the action of the arm, okay? In back view, what you really wanna pay attention to is this right here, that the trapezius will always intersect and that the deltoid will always create this little V, right, right here, V, when the uh, pieces of the puzzle, right, kinda go up in space. My deltoid wants to reach around into the scapula. The scapula is gonna be right here and it connects right here to the back of the scapula. Uh, last but not least, the hand, okay? The hand is complicated. We break it into three different ca categories, uh, the phalanges, the metacarpal bones, and the carpal bones. Can anyone tell me by looking at this illustration, what are the bones that make up your wrist? Carpal bones. Hmm? The radius. The radius, where are you looking, right here? No, the radius is actually part of your forearm. Is it just the carpal bones? And the metacarpal bones. And the metacarpal bones. Dun, 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 dun. Remember I told you, your palm is half of your hand, right? 
So your carpal bones are made up of sesamoid bones. If you haven't heard of sesamoid bones, they're kind of like sesame seeds. They're named after that same concept. Uh, what is the biggest sesamoid bone in your body? Anybody know? I know I'm throwing out a random fact. It is the patella, right? Any bone that is not connected to another bone but can independently move across another bony surface is called a carpal bone. So uh, it's called a sesamoid bone. So these carpal bones, as you're an infant in an embryonic stage, are being... Uh, built up together and they never fuse, which is kind of unique. They actually sit next to each other. Why is this so important to us? It creates a rigid structure, but it also means that rigid structure can do what? It can hold a cup. Yeah, it's flexible, right? It can bend. It can actually pick up things like a little pencil, like an apple pencil, right? Because it can taper itself around. But it also means that if I ever want to hit it, right? It's still going to be a hard bony surface. It's not going to be super flexible. So this is the amazing thing about these sesamoid bones, but then they want to add structure. So you're given these metacarpal bones to connect to that structure. And that creates the webbing, right? That forms the interior of your fingers. So when I'm thinking about a hand, I'm thinking about these two major anatomical landmarks together, right? Uh, do, 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 do I want to go over this? Don't want to do this, yeah. I don't want to go into this too much, too much detail, but we will, we will do this in detail. Uh, so when I think about a hand, I think about these two shapes, and these two shapes always line up in the exact same way. So, boop. I think about a trapezoid that goes around the carpal, bo and carpal bones and comes down, and it looks like this. Okay, can everyone see my red lines? Okay. And then the hands actually look almost identically the same. They kind of do this, and they come around. And if I was to make a measurement tool, right, from the top of my fingers to the base of my carpal bones, halfway down should be the metacarpals. Okay, so they are equal to each other. The big thing I want to think about when I'm drawing the hand is the fact that I'm still drawing a gesture drawing. Right? I'm starting that gesture drawing by drawing through the center of the wrist, and then I'm going into the center of the fingers. Always thinking about the uh, most important movement happening across the hand. And I say most important because your fingers can begin to move in different directions, right? So you're looking for the dominant movement of the hand. When I'm drawing through the hand, I'm always thinking about perspective. So I want to connect my wrist to my carpal bones and my palm. So I draw out the whole palm, right? And then I can build in perspective if I want to, and then I can actually add on my fingers. Remember, my fingers want to be as long, if not longer, a little bit, than as long as the uh, palm, okay? So make sure those palm shapes actually stay consistent. Uh, if you guys take heads and hands, we'll talk about this in detail. I don't want to get into the bones and everything, but what I do want to get to is how to draw the hand. When I think about the hand, I think in terms of two shapes. I think in terms of cylinders and cubes, okay? Why cylinders? Fingers. Why cubes? Palm, right? Two easy relationships. If I can imagine the hand, what I first want to do is imagine the shapes that make up a really complex form. Notice the theme in drawing. Everything starts with what? Shapes, right? It's not like we're reinventing the wheel every time we draw something new. It might be a different vocabulary. With the hand, those shapes break down a lot more complicated, right? This is a big jump from here to here, but let's go through these steps together looking at a drawing. This is a drawing by Steve Houston, H-U-S-T-O-N. What I want to first do is identify the silhouette, okay? So when I'm looking at the hand, I'm drawing from the wrist all the way through to the base of the hand, okay? Once I've drawn that silhouette, I will break it down into planes, okay? I'll imagine that the form is a two by four, right? I'm drawing through that two by four shape, right? I'll draw through the wrist. And before I draw those fingers, I will draw the big shape that actually makes and connects those fingers together. Once I have these shapes together, then I can come in and I can individually break them apart and then get more and more complicated until I get those individual fingers in place. Okay, so conceptually, this is our goal. Now, to go from what I just shot, what I just showed you to this, it takes many, many, many weeks of practice. I don't expect it's going to happen in one week, but I do want you to understand like what the outcome is that we're going for. Okay, the other thing that I want to point out 
is that there is a difference in lines between when I think about bones and when I think about muscles, right? And I reiterate this again just so you don't forget. Bones should be straight. Muscles can be curves or straight. But bones, you always want to try and emphasize those forms because it helps you to understand the P word, which is perspective, okay? Bones are a change in perspective, okay? So here's some more hand examples for you, right? First, shape. Right, break it down to silhouette, break it down to two categories. The first one is the forearm, the second one is the finger, right? Silhouette first, shape second, then I can get into those planimetric details third, okay? All right, so what we're gonna be doing today 